Hi, I'm Mark Suver. I'm Darla Suver. Welcome to Better Way Ministry. We're bringing these weekly Bible programs to you in hope that through the Word of God, your faith will be strengthened and increased in God and in the power of His Word. The King James Bible says in Mark 16, 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the Word with signs following. Amen. And that you would come to know the power of Jesus' name. So that you can understand the immutability of God's promises to us. That when God could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. That God would provide salvation to man, which means deliverance from the power and effects of sin in our life. Through the hope in God's word, you will find the power for your life to overcome and be victorious. That means if the doctor has assigned to you a disease that has a name. Through deliverance and the power of Jesus' name, you can receive your healing and no longer do you have to be under the power of sickness and disease. That's what it means when the Bible said, there is salvation in the name of Jesus. Just believe in that name and obey his word. I hope that you enjoy today's program and those to come and that you will see Jesus bigger than any problem you may be experiencing by the time this program ends. Thank you for watching. May, may the, the Lord, Lord richly bless you. Hi Corpus Christi. My name is Mark Silver and this is Better Way Ministry. We're going to have a Bible study tonight about who is the true God. You know, why does it even matter who the true God is? These are a few questions we're going to go into. We're going to see what the true God said about all these things. Father, we just thank you for your loving kindness to us, that you are the true God. And Father... You open up the hearts, the hearts and minds of all that come past this TV program. That Father, they would be, that their lives would be enriched. That Father, there's a there's a real enemy out here, and he's not the God. He's the destroyer. And Father, only the true God has the power over that destroyer. And Father, it doesn't matter if it's sickness or disease or lack or just doesn't matter. Whatever they're facing, the true God, you, my Father, are the true God and well able and ready to help every living soul through the issues of this life and usher them into the eternal life in the next. Now, Father, we love you. We thank you. Open up our hearts that we might see you and see the God that you've appointed over all power and dominion. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, who's the true God, and what does it matter? Well, as you heard me just praying, it matters that there's a real enemy in this world. And he's a God of this world, but he's not a capital G God. He's a little G God. And the little G God, well, he wanted to be the big G God. And that's what got him kicked out of heaven. And he's on earth right now. And you really need to understand who the true God is to understand the promises left to us, who made them, the power behind them, the power over the little G God that's warring at your life. You ever have more, um, after the money runs out, you have more month left? That's the little G God. He's the one that designed this that economics program. But you know, God has his own economics program. The true God has his own economics program. Now, a man has to work in order to eat, but we live from our giving. And what we sow in seed, we reap a harvest. I mean, this is the economics from above. If you will obey the and find out who the true God is, and what he said about himself, he is a great God. He is a good God. 
And he is well able to overcome the little g God. In fact, he created him. We're going to go over that verse. Where he created the little g God of this world. <clears throat> so, have faith in God is not a slogan, it's a verse. It's forever recorded in the heavens. And because of that, we do have faith in God. All right, who is the true God? First of all, like in nearly every study that I start, every word of God is pure. And he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now I'm talking about the true God. Every word of God is pure. Let's keep going and let's take a look. <clears throat> The words of the Lord are pure words. Now we're not using the word God, we're using the word Lord. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, but thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You know, it's important. I put this in here because I wanted you to understand that God is the one who keeps his word. He is the one that's made sure that every generation from Adam until now have all had his word. He has preserved his word unto every generation. We at the end of the age, we not only have the pure words of God that have been purified seven times in a furnace of earth or man, but we also have hindsight to watch the 2,000 years of the Holy Ghost being turned loose in those that believe. You know, there's a verse over in Acts, in 2.38, it says, Repent and be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this is important, because if you ever read about what Jesus said about the Holy Ghost, mm -mm -mm, it's the promise of the Father. A promise made before the foundation of the earth. It is a promise to get power. It is the power that when... There's a man in the Bible by the name of Simon, the sorcerer. He watched this power, and he watched the power of the Holy Ghost, and he said, boy, give, I'll give you money. Give me that power. Mm -mm. Wrong thing to say. He did not understand the power that he was dealing with. And you can, it cannot be bought with gold and silver. And because he thought he could, it was revealed excuse me, that his uh, soul was still in bondage. And so Peter looked at him and he goes, I perceive you're still in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of sin. Um, and so he, Peter eventually prayed for him and we don't know, but hopefully he got right with the Lord. But the power of the Holy Ghost, you want this power in your life. It's the power that whenever the doctor says, hey, you got sickness and disease, you got cancer, You've got uh, uh, diabetes. You see, you do not have to fear those words when you have the Holy Ghost. Because you can speak to that in the power of the name of Jesus. And if you are delivered, as Jesus said, if you believe, as Jesus said, Jesus said, if you believe on me, as Scripture hath said, out of your belly shall flow a river of living waters. There's a lot of people walking around saying, oh, I believe on Jesus, but there's no river of living waters coming out of their belly. And consequently, that's the test to see if you really believe in Christ. But if you do, and if, and if that is your case, and you've been baptized in Jesus, if you've got the power of the Holy Ghost, you can speak to it. It's a word system. You can speak to your lack. Declare you don't have any. Lack is going to leave your life. I don't care if it's a lack of finances, lack of emotional stability, a lack of love, loving kindness, lack of mercy, a lack of whatever. God is there for you to have the fullness of all the things that he created us to have. And so our Bible are the thoughts of God to every generation. It is not a historical uh, genealogy book. 
I've heard it say that it's a history book. It's a history book about the Jews. Well, the purpose of a Bible is to reveal to man the thoughts of God, the true God, unto every generation. And in doing so, it, you, he will measure your spirit and your belief as to what you believe about what he said you should believe in. But let's keep going. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You know, when I hear the Lord again saying, why believe in this God? Why believe in the true God? Who, who, who cares if it's the true God or not? As long as you worship. As long as you have a good heart. Well, God is very particular. It is the God of heaven and earth that cannot fail. It's the God of heaven and earth that cannot lie. In Psalms 89, he said, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing gone out of my lips. This is good. He pronounces a lot of good things. He goes, uh, there are promises that he can't alter. Uh, because if, if he could have altered them for anybody, he would have altered them because of this person right here that's now preaching the gospel to you. Um, at least in, in my estimation. But he's good. He can't alter them. What he alters is your heart so that you become the good ground to plant this word down into and you become the glory of God. Because everything he said is pure and true, and the things that he said would happen to you do. I no longer fear sickness and disease. I speak to it, I cast it out. It's not that they don't come. I wake up in the morning, I get an ache or pain. We go to bed at night, and you can feel a, <clears throat> some kind of an attack coming on your joint, on your one of your organs or whatever. I just I don't even bother going to the doctor anymore. I just say in Jesus' name, you foul, unclean spirit. This did not come from above. This came from the enemy, the God, a little g, God of this world. Get off me. Because I submit myself before my throne, before the throne of my Father. And with all that is within me, I try my best to hear his voice and do those things that are pleasing to him. I study his word so that I'm not, I won't be ashamed and have learned and the things that I do understand, those I keep close. Those I ask him to order my steps in his word. And he's a God. He fulfills these things. But sicknesses and, and disease, they don't come to me anymore. I've spent most of my life with lack because I didn't understand the, the, the order of what the true God said contained here in his word. And But there's an order. You can have it. You don't have to have the um, uh, lack. You don't have to have um, a lack of anything. Um, God did not put you down here. He did not call you in vain. He did not place his spirit in you in vain. He did not say, hey, I'm a God, I'm the true God, and then reveal himself to you in vain, but so that you would call on him, rely on him, trust in him, and believe in him. And, ah, he's the God that cannot fail you. And whatever, whatever your situation, you're not too far gone. You call today, he'll answer right now. His word is right now. Salvation now is the day of salvation. Now's the time. As soon as you can latch on to this, your healing, your issue will be brought under by the power of the living God over the little G God of this world. And we're going to see where, I'm going to show you a verse, and it'll just shock you. If the Lord re will reveal this to you, it'll shock you that here's Satan, and he's running all the way around the world, and the Lord made him, and God made the waster to destroy. He does a good job at it, but he doesn't destroy God's people. So that's what you, you want to know the true God because you want to know his promises and you want the power that he has over this world in your life to give you all power and dominion. Because as Jesus Christ is, so are we in this present world. So it's as great promise. The God that cannot fail. Why would you put faith in a man who has done nothing but fail? 
who on his own, God said, the true God said, man in his best state is altogether vanity. But why would you not rather put your faith in a God that cannot fail? He's never even, there's no shadow of turning, no variableness. He cannot fail. He is absolutely God. He didn't, nobody forced him to give us his word. He gave it willingly out of a loving kindness. This is the God that you want to meet. This is the God. This is the true God. Hear ye the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cuts a tree out of a forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it moves not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. Now let's just stop here a second. Let's think about that. Here you are, and maybe you take a look around your house. You know, you may have the worship of an idol. It could be sitting around there in your house. It could be in the form of a cross. Maybe you know, there's a lot of people, they like Jesus on that cross. They don't like him, the living, resurrected God of all heaven and earth. Um, because they don't understand him. If they understood who he was, if they understood his, his greatness and his love unto them, then they would like it. But they want to keep him on the cross because they have an idea that they just want to keep on going in what their mind says to do. This is, what the, this is what the heathen do. And he's sitting there and he's saying, and you're going to see this a lot. They have to be carried around. So the God that you serve, is he sitting over there on a, on a, someplace in your house? Is it a frog or a turtle or a cow? Is it something out of creation? Is it something that you just made up? Is it a star? Is it a cross? What kind of an idol is it that you've made? And God talking here is kind of reasoning. He goes, have you ever seen that little piece of stone? Whatever form or fashion it is. Have you ever seen it do bad or evil? And neither is it, is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord. See, this is what the God of heaven and earth says. There's nobody like me. This is God speaking. There's nobody like God. <clears throat> Thou art great, and thy name is great in might. But idols are just that. They are idols. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? Now we understand that the, that the true God of the King James Bible the true God of the King James Bible is a king of nations. He's the king of every nation. For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kings, there's none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. The stock. Remember the palm tree, just a few things above. They're covering it and they're making it into whatever idol, whatever the, whatever the form. A horse, a bird, a star, a fish, a frog, whatever. Um, a cross, whatever. I mean, Jesus was on the cross, and I'm glad that he went to that cross. When he got on that cross, his blood sacrifice on that cross purchased my salvation. Trust me, I'm not making fun of a cross. But he's not on that cross anymore. He got off that cross, and he went to hell. That's where he paid the price for our sin. His soul paid the price for your sin. The blood and the remission and the, and the letting of his blood, that was for a different purpose. That was so he could save you now. Because through his stripes we're healed. But his soul was poured out an offering for sin. His soul is what went into the fires of hell. And paid the price. He tasted death. He tasted hell 
for us. I'm sure that was far worse torture than was what the horrible uh, beatings that he took before he got to the cross and while on the cross. Going into hell, going into the flames of hell, I'm sure was worse than those beatings. But that's where he paid for our sins. This is why when the, when the true God, does you understand this true God, he asked his only son to do this and to pay for our sins. Now the true God is not going to let you bow down to a stock and give you the blessings that was obtained and purchased with his own son's blood. That's why he's saying. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a, is a doctrine of vanities. You see, he is the only, only God that is not a vanity. Even the God of this world. And the Bible calls him the God of this world. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You see, you've got to recognize the fact that God created man in his own image. And in us, and in this flesh, and in our soul operates a spirit. And we're able to have other spirits come in, not just God's. There's evil spirits and unclean spirits, and they can operate within you. And you need to be delivered from them. And they will leave behind strongholds in your thinking processes. you got to pull the strongholds down until you bring every thought, every thought, into the obedience of Christ. And when he said we were made in his image, it was that we were made so that spirits can operate in us and around us. And they can twist your thoughts, but they cannot make you do evil. The power over evil, now in the Old Testament they could, but not no more. Jesus bound the strong man. And the evil that operates today does not operate in the name of Jesus. Jesus bound a strong man, walked through his kingdom healing people. Raising them from the dead. He just ripped through the devil's territory and just tore them up. And he did it right after he was baptized and received the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God. He went in the desert, fasted 40 days, whipped the devil on the spot, came back. Strong man's bound. Now Jesus is walking through Galilee, Capernaum, all of the uh, wherever it was that he was wont to go and he, wherever he went and he healed all that would come to him and that's because he bound that strong man the strong man's bound today that name of Jesus still binds the strong man but, the, but these idols hanging around your houses these are not the true God they have no power to do evil or good and they, that, they are a doctrine of vanity Look at silver is spread into the plates, spread into plates, is brought from Tarshish, and the gold from Euphaz. Now that was a really high, highly f uh, favored gold. The work of the workmen in the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They're all the work of cunning men. They're all the work of cunning. I mean, I don't care if you clothe them. I don't care if it's a gold plate, a silver plate. Um, the goddess Diana, the... the any of the gods that, besides the true God. And look what the true God says. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble. And the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. You know, he got, he, there was, he was indignant with the earth once before. And he destroyed all man except for eight souls by a flood of water. The rainbow that you see in the airs in the air now, when you see a rainbow, uh, God set that there as a token to remind man's mind that he said, "Okay, I destroyed the earth once. I won't destroy it with water, and I won't destroy it again by water." Now he has promised to destroy the earth with fire, but not water. And he put the bow in the air, and we call it a rainbow to this day. Nobody can remove it. Nobody can change it. Nobody can change the, 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 the light bands that are in it. You can't do anything with it except look at it and see it as a token of the true God. 
If your God is more powerful than the true God, then tell him, why don't you put him to a test? Why don't you ask him to take the rainbow out of the clouds? Can't be done. In fact, there hasn't been one God that could change what Adam named every animal, even to this day. Whatever he called them, that's their name to this day, and it cannot be undone. It has not been, and it won't be. But verse 10, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall triple, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. And that's found in Jeremiah 10, 1 through 10. And this is where we were just talking about the flood. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. You see, God made us. And he can destroy us. Um, he can take us from off the face of the earth, just like he created man and put him on it. He's not a God to be tempted nor tried. He's a God to be feared and understood. And once you do, once you fear him and you understand him, then you will love him. Uh, love is the emotion that he first used on us, on man, on the created beings that he has. That's the only reason that we can reciprocate this love is because he first loved us. It says, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing that follows the air, for it repents me that I have made them. And God said unto Noah, the end of all the flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And he did. And there was a, there was a great flood. Um, I'm trying to see where this next verse is at, Isaiah 40. All right. Let's go back here and read Isaiah 40. Because we know that he, de hit, that he destroyed the first earth with a flood. He destroyed all of man on it. Noah built an ark. Noah moved with fear. Fear of God. Built an ark. Took him 120 years, but he got her done. Uh, and then he it took him 120 years not just to build the ark, but then to fill the ark with all the animals. I'm not sure how that he had a very big hand in that. I think most of the animals just all single file went up and got on board. And away they went on the ark. And then God caused the, the waters of the deep to break. The waters that were above the heavens, they broke. Whatever was holding back, no more holding back. It rained and it flooded the earth. Um, several cubits above the highest mountains. And all of man, everything that he just got done saying was, was destroyed. The, the fowls of the air, the, the creeping beasts and man, they were all destroyed. The end of all flesh, not just man's flesh, all flesh. Uh, is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and I, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure? I don't know if we have satellites now. We got the Hubble satellite. We got a lot of satellites. I, look, I take a look at astrology a lot. Psalms 19: The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You look at the skies and the heaven and you're going to see that there is a true God. He is a living God. He's going to declare his glory. Um, and so here Isaiah is talking, and really it's the Lord talking, and he says, Who's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? That's the waters of the earth. And meted out heaven with a span. In other words, measured it. Well, you know, we now know today that the Milky Way galaxy that the Earth is, is in, that this has about a hundred and, uh, I mean, a billion and a half stars contained in the Milky Way galaxy. We now understand that there's probably a billion or, or more galaxies, each galaxy having a multitude of stars, whether it be a billion or a billion and a half, 
And yet God is saying here, I meted out heaven with the span. It is a measurement known only to him. We cannot think in terms of anything other than a light year. And then we start getting light years with zero, 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 zero. We don't know what's, what's after that. There, we don't have a measurement for that. He meted out heaven with a span, and, comp and he comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. In other words, he, could, he knows how much earth weighs. Whenever you look at, like, earth, the size of earth in relationship to the sun, and the, our sun in, like, relationship to some of the other stars that are even in our galaxy, the, the size of the earth would be like a pinhead on this one star. Um, Arcturus or Mark or something like that. Um, it, is an, it is an amazing um, measurement. And that's not even heaven. But when you start looking at the size of these things, and they have these little circles on the illustration that I saw from NASA or whoever it was, an astrologist, you know, they had a little dot over here, and this was, and then they put the Earth's dot next to the sun. Well, it's quite small next to the big sun. Then they just skip Earth, then they take our sun, and then it's a little teeny dot next to a sun. And then they have this sun, and it becomes a microscopic spot. This, like, sun the size of a basketball. Well, Earth was way back here, this tiny little dot on this one. I mean, it's incredible. So whenever you start thinking like in those types of terms and you start looking at creation, you start looking at the heavens, it declares his glory, the glory of the true God. And so for him to comprehend the dust of the earth, yeah, I bet he could do that pretty probably uh, like real easy. Not a hard thing for God. Uh, <clears throat> and meted out to heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Right as soon as he gets done with that, he goes, Hey, who's directed the Spirit of the Lord? What an odd place to throw that in. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselors taught him? Well, no one has an answer for that. Because nobody's directed the Spirit of the Lord. God the true God directs the Spirit of the Lord. Why? Why put that in there right then? Because he just got you to start thinking about who holds the water in his hands. Who has, I can tell you how much the earth weighs, not Mark, but God. God speaking, saying through Mark, says, hey, I can tell you how much the earth weighs. What else did he say? He goes, I've weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Next verse why does he put this here? Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding? Hmm. What's the purpose of this whole Bible study? If you don't understand who God is, the true God, the love that he has applied to your life. If it is a gift, he is a God that will come one day with vengeance, but that's not today. Today he's coming with grace. He just wants to tell you about who he is. You weren't there then the day that he made the heavens and the earth. So he tells you, hey, I made the heavens and the earth. And so because we weren't there, he has to tell us or we'll never have any understanding or knowledge. But as soon as he gets done telling us that, hey, I measured out the mountains and the scales, I, 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 I balanced out the, uh, the hills, um, he wants to become bigger in your eyes than your problem is. Why? Because he wants to inject goodness to your life. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of good. God, want, God is not a God sitting up there wanting to do bad to people or just wipe out the whole earth with water again. Hey, it's over. He's not up there being bad or being mean with us. 
He's a God up there is waiting on anybody whose eyes will lift unto the heavens and look at the heavens and say, Dear God, are you there? I need some help. Oh, let me tell you what. He'll dispatch the angels. You find out that you have the power of the living Christ with a mere word away from you to your situation that you can speak in the name of Jesus. I'm not receiving cancer. I'm not receiving diabetes. Hey, they may have to operate on the person next to me, but on me, they're not going to operate because the God of heaven is going to show up and he's going to take care of whatever it is the ailment that I have. This is the God. I want to magnify the Lord in your eyes because you weren't there when he made the heavens and the earth, so he tells us. But then he, as soon as he gets your attention, who's, who directed the Spirit of the Lord or gave him understanding? Behold the nations... Or as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as a small dust out of the balance. <coughs> you take a little rag. If you ever went into a gold assayer's or metal assayer's, <coughs> and you see and you see the scales, and the scales are such that they should have a little bar, and they tilt back and forth, and they pivot on this little thing like this. And they hang down off each side, and what he does, he takes a cloth. He'll uh, give it a shake, take it, and wipe off the plate, and then fasten the plate onto whatever it is that's hanging down. Do the same thing on the other side so that you're equally balanced. But so that the dust, the fine dust of that little teeny scale where he's going to meet out whatever it is, a dollar, two dollars, a thousand dollars worth of gold, whatever. That dust doesn't interfere in any way, and it's a perfect, perfect read. But it's, a, it's dust. It's just, it can't be measured. He measures very fine, small amounts of things, but this dust can't even be measured. We just wipe it off and give it a shake, and we say, we see the dust go up in the air, and that's it. That dust that goes up in the air, yeah, are counted as the small dust. It's counted that the nations of the earth to the God that we serve. God's trying to magnify himself in this word so that your faith, in the is in a big God. He's not a small God. He chose to leave himself behind uh, the scenes, so to speak, performing the work and the power through his son. This is it. This is what we're going to see. This may be a one message, or this could be a two or a three-parter here. Doesn't seem like we're making much time, but we got a long way to go. But anyways, not worried about that. We want to magnify the Lord in your life so that you'll see how it's really simple to call on a big God. If the God you have is a piece of rock over there and you sit and you look at it and he doesn't do anything bad, he doesn't do anything at all. If he moves from there, if he moves from the couch to the, to the uh, end table, well, it's because you had to bear him. If that's your God, I can understand that you have no hope of having any kind of power against sickness, disease, lack, these other things. And you would start restraining yourself or, or to the ways of the world. And what did he say? The very first verse that we went to up here said, hey, don't be like the heathen. They fall down and they worship these stocks and stones. And then if they have a real cunning guy, he can put some blue or purple over them. Or maybe he'll even beat out some gold and silver and stick on it. And then wait, this little idol, it'll last. You can give it down from generation to generation. He'd throw them all away. Meet the real God. He takes up the isles as a very little thing. That's all of the nations. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. offering. Lebanon in the old days, they had the cedars of Lebanon. Cedars that you'd take, I don't know how many people to reach around. You'd all have to hold hands. Probably a prayer group. You'd all have to grab around there and it's huge trees. And he says, hey, all the force of Lebanon, there's not enough to even burn the beast sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing and they're counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Well, 
What is it that God's after? It's not the nations. He wants individuals, individual people on this planet to recognize him as God. The devil is running around down here and he's running loose in this earth and he wars against you because you were made in the image of God. When he sees you, he sees the God that's going to put him into hell. He knows he's going to hell. He knows that hell is going to be put into the lake of fire. And he knows he has a short time. So what does he do? He's down here deceiving, deceiving people. Deceiving people so that they will worship or cry out to a statue, to a stone, but not to the true God, not to the living God. And this is it. This is the choice that you have in life. This is the good versus evil, or the evil that is, that is trying to overcome you. And most people, this God that I'm describing, that's written here, that we read about, is so good and so wonderful and so big, most people won't believe. To whom then will you liken God? Now God's going to ask you another question. Who are you going to liken God to? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? The workman melts a graven image, and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold and casts silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he has no ablation chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have you not known? Have you not heard? And has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretched out the heavens as a curtain, and he spread them out as a tent to dwell in. That brings the princes, or the kings, and the kingdoms to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted, yea, they shall not be sown, yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth, and he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Before we lift our eyes up on high, and before we go to these next verses, he covers a lot of stuff. I mean, it sounds about like today. I mean, here it is. To whom will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? The workman melts a graven image. Have you got a little cross? A little cross with Jesus on it? Is that, is that the Jesus that you worship? Or, I mean, I'm not against crosses. But if you worship it, it, I am. He's telling you he's a living God. He's not on a cross. And we're really not to make images of anything, not of his cross. They, in the Old Testament, they built a, a serpent because God sent a serpent through there. And through there because they were going after another God. So he sent a serpent through the middle of them that was biting them. And he told Moses, he goes, okay, I'll tell you what, they want to look at it, serpents, or they want to worship certain serpents, then make a golden serpent and stick it up in the air, and whoever looks at the golden serpent, then he's going to live. So he does. Hundreds of years later, they still have this gold serpent, and it's become a real thorn in their side because they're making a god out of the thing instead of worshiping the, the god. And that's what he's talking about here. Look, and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold. And he has silver chains so that it hangs off of you, or off of your camel, or off of your cow, or off of the door, or off of the wall, or off of the ceiling. He that is so impoverished 
that he has no oblation, in other words, no offering, chooses a tree that's not going to rot. And he seeks unto him, like, oh, they make a cedar tree or whatever. Have you not been heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? Well, who, can, who among these gods that you have, that you worship, if you're worshiping another god, none of them were around at the foundation of the earth. But the god that was around at the foundation of the earth, he will tell you that what he has declared from the foundation of the earth, because he declared the end from the beginning. It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in that brings the princes to nothing. It makes the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth, and he shall also blow upon them. Let's say that something does get planted out there. Now he's going to... He's going to burn them up in the field. Take a look at where there's no rain in the earth. What is it that they worship? Even here in America, in the Bible Belt, see the drought? It's a drought of God's Word. It is no other. God promises to bring the, the former rain and the latter rain on the countries and the people who are observing God in the manner that he has prescribed. If you're in the middle of a drought, look up. Go before him. Get delivered. If you have a drought in your life, maybe it's not a drought of, of rain because you don't have, you're don't have you not a farmer, you're not growing things, but you have a drought in your life of goodness, of peace, of comfort, of health, of well-being. Do you have a lack of these things? You need to be delivered. You need to go before the throne and ask the God, the God that from the that was has been declaring from before the foundation of the earth, declaring the end, declaring to all living souls precisely what it takes to worship him and have goodness. You need to go and get delivered so you go before him, present yourself before the throne with confidence, listen to his voice. And have him tell you what he wants you to do. Do not write me to ask me what you should do. I have to go before the throne to find out what I'm to do. You have got to go before the throne to find out what you're to do. But when you go before the throne, go with confidence. And then present yourself. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. Present yourself before the throne every day, because it's a daily, because Jesus said it's daily, therefore it is, and wait for the answer from your Father. He's good. He will tell you. He will converse with you. He will tell you what, what the issues are that you're going to face that day. Hey, look, but don't worry. I got this. I got your back. I got you covered. He has come to me so many times. He has never done anything except for tell me that... I've got you. You take no thought for your life. You seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the things that the Gentiles are out there seeking. What did we say? What did we say at the beginning of this? Don't be like the heathen. They're all running around the earth trying to get to them. I'll just give it to you. You don't have to run around the earth. What you have to do is worship me as the one true God. This is what he's after. This is what the true and the living God. Every other God is not alive. There are no other gods that are alive. There is but one living God. He was alive before the foundation of the earth. He made the earth. Let's keep going. He's going to blow on them. And they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift your eyes, lift your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, 
by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one fails. He's looking into the heavens. He calls them all by name. A billion stars. A billion and a half in one galaxy. Just ours. Calls them all by names. It says he knows the number of the hairs of your head are numbered. The hairs are numbered. His job in numbering my head has been getting a little easier lately. I've been talking to him about that. I've been using Jesus' name on it. That's probably the only reason I got a little bit left in front here. And we're believing Jesus' name for some asides, too. Anyway. What sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known? See, there's a, like a two-way conversation here. He just takes the place of man for us, and he and he goes ahead and because it applies, it applies to our heart. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel? Now Israel is his chosen people. He didn't choose them because they were the most numbered. In fact, he chose them because they were the fewest in in number on the earth. That's what he said. I chose Israel to make them my people because they were fewer in number than anybody. Therefore. Anything good that came out of Israel, that was going to be the doer of it. Jacob and Israel, who have had the history with the Father of being the chosen people of God, he says, they're saying, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Then God saying to them, have you not known? Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's Isaiah 40. What does it say? Who? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now they're over here and they're talking about how to, we're in a bad way. Man, God passed us over. There is no judgment from above. Hey, man, I'm living in a drought. I'm living in lack. Man, the doctors, oh, I can't hardly walk. My hip's getting worse. My cancer's just flaring up. There's just no goodness anywhere. What am I doing in this life? God is saying to you, what did he say? Look again. I want you to get this. I want you to understand that the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he faints not. Neither is he weary. He can take your problems and he can make them all go away. He can take you by the hand and walk you through them. There is a power from the true and the living God that defies understanding. But let me tell you what. He goes over this over and over. He goes, look around at what you call a God. They can't even do bad. Let's think about that. I mean, we all, everybody sits around saying, well, what kind of good does it do? But hey, what kind of bad? How could it do bad? Hey. Let him throw a rock at his neighbor. Let him throw a rock at you. Let him wake you up in the middle of the night and throw something at you and say, hey, pfft, wake up. I don't like you. He can't do that. Not only can he not do you evil, he can't do you good. But because you worship it, it will be evil to you from the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He's the one that does not faint. He's the one that is not weary and his eyes are not shut. Nothing escapes his view. He has, a, uh, 
he has a, a little angel that sits up there that writes down in a book everything I do. Little angel. The books will be open at the end of my life. It'll go before a judge. There's some things that are written in there that I really wish weren't. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ over those things. Ask God to have mercy upon me. Forgive me. He does. He says, all right. Get up. Let's go again. Keep looking up. Look up. He gives power to the faint. Are you about ready to quit? You need power. Look up. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Is that you? Call his name. His name is Jesus. Nobody gets to the God, the Father, but through the Son. You have to call that Son's name if you ever want the power of the Father. If you want any of this power to come in your behalf, it's going to come through the Son. We're going to read it. Let's start reading. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, and that we may know that you are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Now, uh, let's think about this. This would be good. There's a lot of people running around. They're worshiping, I mean, man, there's whole uh, religions of all kinds that worship a man who got a revelation and the revelation that the man got came from God. Even though we can read that the God said, hey, I speak for myself. And unless I have ordained and unless I have sanctified someone to write on my behalf, it's not from me. And somehow man gets caught up in this trap where you can't believe and you don't know how to believe whether or what to believe or who to believe who actually heard and yet there's a demonstration Jesus said if ye will do the world the if you will do the words I tell you if you'll do the doctrine of my father you'll know whether the words that I speak to you whether the words that Jesus speaks to you whether the words in this Bible are are of man or God in the doing, you will know. 